So we are in the study of the survey series we've entitled Jesus. And this song really plays into it. There's different elements of the song that are kind of like, wow, that's different. But the idea is this. Jesus is thought of kindly, isn't he, in culture and in Christianity. And generally speaking, whether someone's Republican or Democrat, they will point to Jesus uh, for backing on, uh, on whatever their policies, whatever their thoughts are. Both candidates this year both would claim to be Christians and both have different denominational backgrounds. But Jesus is thought of kindly in culture. And that's true across most genre of the, of the culture. And so what we want to do is, while Jesus thought of kindly, we want to look back and see how he was viewed when he was here. Because a lot of times we make Jesus out to be who we want him to be, and then we think kindly of him because he fits with our thinking about him. And so our hope in this series is to really capture what did Jesus say about himself? What did those who walked with him say about him? How did people respond to him in that day so that we can hopefully get a better view of the Jesus scriptures. And so in this culture, it has been viewed that way for a long time. Jesus has been thought of favorably, really, from the get-go. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said this of Jesus. He said, his parentage was obscure, his conditions poor, his education dull, his natural endowments great, his life correct and innocent. He was meek, benevolent, patient, firm, disinterested, and at the same time, sublimist, sublimist, Sometimes the eloquent, however you say that. I don't disagree with the fact that Jefferson was right in painting this picture of Jesus, but he missed the point. The point, as we can see today in John, is it was not the meekness of Christ, not the patience of Christ, the gentleness of Christ. It was that Jesus Christ claimed to be Going along with that, PBS ran a special a few years ago called From Jesus to Christ. And the basic premise for, that, for PBS's special series on this, From Jesus to Christ, was that Jesus only took on deity when Paul spun it that way in order to make more followers. Harvard liked PBS's special so much that they did a two-day symposium following that where a bunch of Harvard profs got to collaborate and, and endorse, mainly, this whole idea that Jesus never claimed to be God. There was nothing uniquely, nothing unique about him in that way. Simply, this was Paul's idea. Another book was written, in a Christian so-called book, not too long ago, that, or spun that way, where Jesus, in this book, according to this book, was never claimed to be God, it really wasn't until Athanasius came along and spun it into Jesus being God. In fact, you have other quotes, and one pastor, Mark Dever, uh, quotes different books, and in one book, Jesus is called the, the best example of a CEO. Another called him the a reflection of God. Not God, but a reflection of God, and yet still another called him insufferably ordinary Galilean layman. Jesus is thought of kindly because they dismiss one element, that he claimed to be God. Now, I want to make this point to you this morning, and I hope that you don't think, man, I would never believe that, because you know what? You know when we treat him as less than God, when we worry, get angry, when we're frustrated, and when we, we think life is, ah, right? There's a lot of times, to be honest with you, you and I treat him as a man, but not as God. So we can look on PBS and go, what? And the Harvard elites and go, you don't need to read the Bible. And they do. But maybe we do too. Because if you're like me, I still find myself failing at times to go, man, that thinking treats Jesus as a man, but not as God. I do it. I suspect some of you do it as well, right? So we need to be reminded that Jesus is God, and we need to know from Scripture. So, we're going to look at this book of John. First, a quick review. Matthew was about Jesus as what? His authority. He was king. He was the authority. In fact, from the beginning to end, he amplifies this idea that Jesus is all authority in 
Heaven and on is mine. Wow. That's a big claim. The result was, chapter 16 to 18, either discipleship or chapters 19 to 23, judgment. That's your only options if he really has all authority. But remember, we went from Matthew to Mark, and he was the suffering servant, the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. As a suffering servant, he came to serve in ways that most didn't even like. Do you remember the two main categories of, we're just going to call it Christianity, it was essentially God's people then? One was the Pharisees, the other was who? Sadducees. To the Pharisees, Jesus was way too liberal. How could you hang out with those people? How could you reach out to those people? How could you break our rules? They had all kinds of added rules. And they loved their rules more than they loved what? God. So the Pharisees didn't need Jesus. When he came, he was a nuisance because he didn't keep their rules. They had rules-based righteousness. The Sadducees, Jesus was way too what? Way too fundamentalist. He actually interpreted this thing literally. How could he dare take it literally? No way. To the liberal side, their righteousness is tolerance. They don't need Jesus. They've got tolerance. They're more loving than him in their own thinking. Both sides, when Jesus came, determined they didn't want his righteousness. The question becomes, could that be still true amongst those who name the name of Christ today? Those are things we've got to be careful of, aren't they? Because we can fall into one of those two camps, and I suspect we're all susceptible, either to one side or the other, or both sides. We want to walk in the righteousness of Christ. Well, as we got to Luke, Jesus in Luke is what? You guys remember? He is Savior. He is Savior, but he's not saving us from tyranny, racism, poverty. What did he come to save us from? From ourselves. If he had offered salvation from anything else, everybody was that they were looking for, man, yay! But Jesus come, I'm here to save you. Like, yeah, from you. Wait a minute. That offends me. That was their response, wasn't it? He came to save us from our sins. So those who responded, we looked at, did men respond? Sure. So you spent a lot of time with the 12, the 70. Yes, he discipled the men. Did the women respond? Yes. And sometimes they were more spiritual than the guys, right? You have uh, John the Baptist's mom seems to be a little bit more confident in the words than John the Baptist's father. You have times where Mary is just writing this magnificent, and just this praise of God. Yes, women. Yes, children. He drew children to himself. The poor, the outcast. It was usually the marginalized that went, I want salvation from my sin. Remember? They have the disciples gathered, but it's the former prostitute who loves him more. Isn't it? Whoever's been forgiven much loves much. And so Jesus draws these outcasts to himself because they want forgiveness from their sins. And they found Jesus to be everything they ever longed for because he offered them personal forgiveness. Now we're in the book of John. And like I said, all of these books really deal with all these points, but each book uniquely amplifies some aspect. And for John, it's Jesus as God. He is God in all the Gospels, but John makes this point. I don't want you to believe it because I said it. I just want to look at some passages this morning, and we're going to start with the theme of this book. And so we said Luke was really an apologetic. He's given a defense for the Gospel. He compiled all these things. He's writing to Theophilus. What this book of John is, is really a Gospel track. Here's why. John 20, 21. John 20, 31, excuse me. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Remember PBS special? From Jesus to Christ? Oh, this happened later. It didn't happen later. He says that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We're going to expand upon this idea of life next week. The life he came to give us now and then. But this is what it's about. This whole book was written to give us, really, a gospel track. And what you're going to find in here, and to kind of set the stage, we read some more passages, is this. We think of Jesus kindly because we remake him into our own image. He was not well-liked in his day. In fact, the fierceness of opposition to Jesus begs the question, why would anyone call him the 
perfect example of a CEO or the extremely ordinary Galilean. Let me show you some things. And so, first off, if you look at some of the opposition to Jesus, in chapter 6, you have, um, and you don't have to turn all these, I've got a bunch of verses here, I'm going to read a number of them, you're welcome to, but in 659, he says, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Did his own disciples like what you're saying? Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Hmm. We think kindly of him, but even his disciples struggled with what he was saying. In fact... As a result, some of them abandoned him. As a result, verse 66 of John 6, of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. A number of his own disciples said, that's does it. If you're gonna if you're gonna make these claims, I'm out of here. Hmm. His own brothers, according to chapter 7, verse 5, says, For not even his brothers were believing him. He was making some colossal statements. Even his own brothers were like, that can't be true. You would struggle with that too if your brother claimed to be God. Right? He was claiming to be God. They recognized. Even his own brothers didn't believe him. Some, in fact, in chapter 7, verse 12, listen to this. There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Some in his day were saying, this is a liar and a deceiver. The Bible is amazingly accurate, isn't it? If you were writing this, would you add this stuff in here? This is inspired by God. He just tells it like it is. Verse 47, the same chapter, in verse, uh, chapter 7 says this, The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? The religious establishment looked at Jesus and said, All he's doing is deceiving the people and following in this deception. He also was accused of having a demon in verse 20 of the same chapter. Chapter 7, the crowd answered, You have a demon! So the crowd's going, This Jesus guy... He's demonically possessed. I don't think they thought as kindly of Jesus as we make him out. Chapter 10 and verse 20, he says this. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. We think of Jesus kindly, don't we? Did they? Well... They tried to arrest him in chapter 7, verse 30 to 32. They tried to stone him in chapter 8, verse 59. They tried to kill him in chapter 11, verse 53. What does that sound like? It sounds like the claims he was making was so overly offensive to the people that they claimed he was a liar, a deceiver, demonically possessed. They tried to stone him, kill him. His own disciples said, who can stand this, and flaked off. So there must be something different about this Jesus that the Jesus presented often in culture that everyone thinks so well of, right? But all of this, John said in John 1, 11, he says, he came into his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Did you get that? Remember, this is like the hub of the Bible-centric people on earth at the time. This would be like showing up, being able to have some mega conference where you invite churches small to large, all to gather around, and you're expecting the Messiah, you're expecting Jesus to come, and just go, yay! And he shows up and goes, whoa! And you're saying, wait a minute. And he caused you to rethink the whole paradigm, didn't he? Because they, whether a Pharisee or Sadducee, had in their own mind, their own righteousness, their own perspective on God, and it was way different. Well, clearly, instead of thinking kindly, his ministry proved to be extremely inflammatory to the people. And this is why. The heart of why everybody turned on Jesus. The, part, the heart of why they called him demon-possessed, insane, even his own family didn't believe him, was because what he claimed in regards to God the Father. So listen to this. Going back to chapter 1, like I said, I'm bouncing all over the place, you can follow or not, but chapter 1 and verse 34, he says this, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. According to verse 32, that was John testifying that this is the Son of God. Or in verse 49 of chapter 1, he says, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Again in chapter 3, and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that, through, that the world might be saved through him. Or in chapter 5, he says this, verse 25. In fact, he says in verse 25 and 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He's talking about life in himself being self-sufficient. Just like the Father is all-sufficient in and of himself, he needs nobody, he needs nothing. So the Son is all-sufficient in and of himself, he needs nothing, he needs no one. Hmm. Or again, if you skip to chapter 17 of John and verse 1, he says this, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Do you think the people in that day understood what he's talking about? Here's what he says in 19.7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. So what was so inflammatory about Jesus was what he was claiming in regards to the Father. That's why everyone hated him, called him insane, called him demon-possessed, Wanted to kill him, even his own disciples left him. So look at this. In chapter 20, in verse 31, it says this. We started with it. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so we see the Son of God. And when Jesus is using the term Son of God to describe his relationship to the Father, we often hear people use it to say, see, there's a difference. See how distant. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, means that he was just created by God, or that he was just sort of chosen by God. But, you know, Jesus used the term to show how intimately entwined he was. So we take that very same term and try to pull it apart and say, see, he was the Son of God. Like, some will say, we're all children and sons and daughters of God. And you can believe that. And you can profess that. You can proclaim that. That Jesus, like all of us, was just a child or a son or daughter of God. But you can't go to heaven. Because you essentially reduced Jesus down to a man. And Jesus was proclaiming to be God. To be equal of one substance and one nature with the Father. In fact, there are eight I am statements in this. Do you remember when God says, I am that I am? Do you remember when he makes that statement? Back in Exodus, Moses shows up, a bush is burning, it's not burning out. Take off your sandals, ground you're standing on this hole. Who are you? I am that I am. I'm the eternal one. I've always existed. Jesus comes, and in John 8, all right, John, he gives eight I am statements. We'll just read a couple of them here. In fact, in John 15, 1 and verse 5 as well. But he says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Verse 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. He abides in me, and I in him. He bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Also, in chapter 10, verse 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd. In chapter 10, verse 7 and 9, I am the gate. In verse chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. When Jesus says, I am, I am, I am, he's associating himself with the Old Testament great I am of God. Did Jesus believe he was the great I am? The Jews thought unmistakably that that was the claim he was making. So offensive was Jesus that he was no, far from being accepted as a great CEO or a mere peasant, he was despised and hated, rejected even by his own followers. Mm. And so, hearkening back to that, in John 8, verse 56, he says this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Did you get that? <laughs> Abraham was the epitome of a faithful follower of God. 
Abraham had been dead and gone for a couple thousand years by this point. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, this is 857, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. You are claiming to be the great I am, the eternal one from all these ages past. You're claiming to be God of very God of one substance and one essence and one nature with the Father. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself in the temple. The crux of everything in human history comes down to one question. Who is Jesus? Get it wrong, there's hell to pay. Get it right, there's eternal bliss, right? That is the way Jesus presents himself. So in a day that looks kindly on Jesus, it's only because the story has been changed. He was called insane, demon-possessed, hated, despised, rejected of men, and yet some found in him that he was indeed, is indeed, the great I am, the great God of very gods. And this is the main point of John's book. In fact, John 1, he says this in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Listen to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as, the, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God literally walked on this earth. That's his point. And God is Jesus. Equal with the Father, equal with the Son, the Trinitarian God, the one in Genesis 1, 1, 1 that says, let us make man in our image, the pluralistic God, he's one God, three persons. That's God. In a day where we don't follow these things. We don't believe these things. Great names in evangelical circles don't even believe these things. We need to go back to the Bible and figure out the Jesus of the Bible. Not the Jesus of PBS, not the Jesus of Harvard, not the Jesus of a lot of these books, but the Jesus who reveals himself in the Word of God as being God. So again, in chapter 10 and verse 30, he says this, John 10 and verse 30 through 33. I and the Father are one. The Jews pick up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Pretty clear what he was claiming. It wasn't missed in his day. And you know what? If you take Jesus to be a man, you can find favor in everyone around. Everybody will like you. But if you spin that to say, wait a minute, Jesus is God. You're not actually spinning it. You're just being truthful. Now all of a sudden, everyone's got a problem with you. Because nobody wants that Jesus. Mm. But because Jesus is God, listen to this in chapter 9. In verse 35, he says this. Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Do you remember when God set up the Ten Commandments? What was worship to be ascribed to? God alone. That's the heart and essence of the the Ten Commandments was, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship no other gods. When Jesus received his, oh man, don't worship me. Remember all the angels? Don't worship me. I'm just a fellow servant. Stand up. But when Jesus is worshipped, he never turns it away. Why? Because he believed himself to be God of very gods. Equal in all ways with the Father. Important, important stuff. Important stuff. And so, as a result... Verse 30 of chapter 20, he, he talks about, and because of these signs and wonders, and he, he showed in many ways, not just proclaimed it. He turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. We're talking about he healed. He raised the dead to life. He healed the blind, the lame, the sick. Over and over and over, just miracle after miracle after miracle. Even his detractors recognize that. In John eleven forty-seven, 47, he said this. 
Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. Even those who hated him most, the Pharisees, couldn't deny that he was doing all of these signs, proving that he was truthful and proclaiming to be God. So, as a result, the question becomes, how do we respond? You see, if Jesus is just, as culture puts it, he's just a kindly uh, Jewish peasant, you can dismiss his words. It won't matter. You could reinterpret it like you'll reinterpret the Constitution. It doesn't matter. He can't command you. He can't direct you because the fact is, any direction he gives, he's not with you anyways. He can't provide for you because he's long gone. Anything he would say would be no better than a therapist and probably worse because in many people's minds, he lived 2,000 years ago and we've progressed so far from there, uh, he's really of no value to you anyways. That's Jesus as a man, isn't it? But if he becomes what he said he was, that is, if he is the God of very gods, then he not only commands you, he'll one day cause you to stand before him and give account for what you did in his commands. If he is, like he said he is, God of very gods, then he can provide for you, he can protect you, he can direct you, he can walk with you, you can fellowship with him. He actually runs and wields the universe for the good of his people. Because in fact, he is God of very gods like he claimed. And so it's a continental divide. And we need to remind ourselves in a world that thinks kindly of Jesus, they don't think kindly of this Jesus. But we do. Because the Jesus of the Bible that we believe in, and then, so that even brings up the question of this idea of belief and its centrality to being able to have a relationship with God. So in chapter 6, and verse 28, he says this, in chapter 6, verse 28. Therefore God said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Okay, so you need to believe in the one he sent, in Jesus Christ, right? There's a lot of even questions over what that means. How do you believe? Well, first and foremost, it goes to his words. In chapter 4, verse 41, he says, Many more believed because of his word. What were they believing as a result of? His word. So it starts with the word God, our belief does. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So it starts by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So when we try to convince somebody, Man, you've got to believe, you've got to believe. Actually, all we're doing is saying, Thus saith the Lord. And as long as we're interpreting it right, which is the basic, hey, it's just taking it to face value, we're proclaiming God. And we're saying, hey, this is what's true about God. So, belief, first and foremost, starts with hearing God's word and believing it. In fact, he goes on, faith is faith in the person and work of Jesus alone in chapter 11 in verse 25 and 26 he says this Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die do you believe this he's saying do you believe that I have the power to grant eternal life that is what he said in John 1 12 right I can make you a child of God completely by gift righteousness I can give this to you if you believe question continues to be, wait a minute, this idea of believing and trusting fully in Christ, what does that look like? And maybe the closest association in John with belief is in chapter 6, 27, he says this, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So faith and what are compared to that verse, listen to it again. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So faith and love. Faith and love. Mm. So belief, you can see, belief is bigger than just believing that what he's, in, in these words he's saying. Everybody heard the words, but only some believe so as to love him and obey. In fact, he makes this point again in John 14. He says this. Verse 21, 
he who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Again, John closely associates belief in God with love for God. And so it isn't a matter of just knowing what he said. A lot of people knew what he said. There was a lot of people in that day who had faith in their thinking, but who didn't have genuine confidence and trust in Christ so that he saved. And so he says, you have to come and believe that I am, and it will result in what? That you'll love me. You'll love me. And if you love me, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Or again, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our vote with him. So interchangeably, at, at a level, John is talking about faith and love, isn't he? And not that just having the words, or necessarily just having the emotions, but having the words that drive a love for God that results in what? Obedience. But we sit here as people who are still jacked up, right? There are still ways in all of our lives that we really fail to love and obey God. And it would be, the culture likes to say, man, I love God, whether I obey him or not. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll obey. So if we believe that Jesus is God, so as to actually go, man, this is God, I found the Savior, and we rely fully on his righteousness, not our own, now all of a sudden we have love, because man, all that junk that I've ever done, all my unworthiness before God, all those things would lead me to hell as the right, just thing to do for God and God's part, have now been washed away, and I have a relationship with God. And so I love him. We love him because he first loved us, and now I want to obey him. But there's areas where you don't obey is where you don't love because you don't believe. It's true, isn't it? So if you want to track down the areas of unbelief where you treat God as no more than a mere man, that is what it is, right? Because as a mere man, you feel no obligation to follow you doubt his goodness, you question his authority or his directions. And so thereby, you create your own rules, you go by your own systems, and you do it your own way, and you can always track that down, because you always find chaos. Just give it time. All you have to do is track down the chaos in your life, and you'll find the unbelief that's leading to a lack of love, and it's resulting in a lack of obedience. Because chaos always follows. Mm. So, that leaves us with this. Clearly, the culture thinks kindly of Jesus. Everyone wants Jesus on their side. In Jesus' day, you're insane, you're demon-possessed, we hate you, we want to kill you. Even those who follow them were like, that does it. You said that, I'm out of here. And even those who seem to be his disciples flaked on him and said, we don't want you. We don't want that Jesus. So the question is, do you get that Jesus is God? Number one. And secondly, are you willing to pray, and I think we all need to say, God, there are still ways. Instead of saying, oh, all the bad culture and Harvard and all this, stuff, the real question isn't so much what they take of Jesus. The question is, why do I still have pockets of unbelief in my heart that lead me to fail to love God and obey him as I ought to? And what can I do about that? Because clearly, Jesus, who taught, as we looked at in Matthew, he believed everything that he said was binding on he was a servant. He actually called a group of people, a new humanity out, to become servants to humanity. Servants to bring his truth into a world and love them, even though they would be despised and hated. A God who is bringing personal salvation and has begun the renovation process with his people that one day will extend throughout the earth. When the lion lays down with the lamb, a day when Christ will rule and reign, we're heading to that. But the question remains for us today, and I would encourage you to pray, and then we're going to sing a song, and we've got a uh, baptism here, which is going to be awesome. But think for a minute, and I'm going to give you a chance to pray, even as Abraham comes and, and the team comes up to play and worship God. I want you to think for a minute and really pray that God would reveal what are the areas of chaos, and how is that the result of treating Jesus as a mere man and not as God? 
and as a result, failing to love no man. So spend a minute in prayer, and then we're going to sing a song, and then we're all going to go outside and celebrate new life that God has brought, and the celebration of, of really their commitment to follow and their entire life, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me pray for us, and then I just invite you to spend a minute in prayer. Father, we recognize the Son is equal with you. We recognize the Son as the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, your glory, through Jesus Christ. We recognize the world did not know him, even the world of those who seem to be really in tune to the Bible, really missed because they failed to see how this all led up to you and your righteousness that is gifted to us by faith. God, I pray that we would all be confident that it's your righteousness alone that saves us, and that we would so not only believe you so as to receive this righteousness, but continue to grow in believing in all areas of life where we would learn to love, trust, and obey you more and more and more so that all the areas of our life come under your Lordship. We thank you. We want, to, we want to love you better than we do. We want to follow and obey you more than we do. We are thankful that, that our salvation is based on your complete obedience to the Father and it's not based on our, our obedience, our works, or any of that. So may you just, uh, uh, just reign through our hearts through the Holy Spirit uh, just a grace to evaluate and show us where we need to continue to grow, where we need to believe you Love you and obey you. Do you stand for